Okay. All right. Val, do you want to start by telling us about how you got into training and your journey to this point so far? Yeah, totally. So thank you guys so much for having me on. This is always a really excited opportunity when I get to talk to other people about things. So my name is Valerie Lasparti, and I am a married mother of three boys. So super busy with my <laughs> all the testosterone in the household. It's very crazy. And I started into fitness back in 2016. I actually had had just had my last child and was experiencing some pretty severe postpartum depression. And my, my doctor said, Hey, like you need to find something that you can do that's outside of the house. Like you need to like find Valerie again, essentially. And he goes, why don't you go to the gym? And I was like, mm, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> but I, 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 I thought, well, yeah, maybe. Cause if I go to some classes, you know, then I will, I'll meet some people. And so that was like my initial like kick in the pants of like, maybe do something and find something for yourself outside of just being a mom, like find something that's for you. And so that's how I initially got into it. And then my husband just like shortly thereafter was like, Hey, so I want to do a contest prep. And this coach I found, if you join me, it, he only like, it's a 50% discount if the spouse does it too. And I was like, sure, why not? I'm saying yes to everything. So let's do it. I had no idea you guys what I was getting into, like zero clue. I was just like, yeah, this sounds great. And a few months later we were, you know, in our prep and we went to a show and then I was like, oh, <laughs> I signed up for this. Okay. Sparkly bikini, six inch heels, crazy <laughs> orange tan. All right. Well, I'm committed. Like I'm going to do this. So let's see what happens. And <laughs> so um, that was how I got into the bikini stuff. And from there, it, it kind of just was this natural progression for me. My, my coach owned a gym and he um, so he had trainers under him and he said, you know, just your mindset and the way that you've approached things with prep, I think you would make a really good coach for other women and I would love to mentor you. And so that was how I got into coaching. And so it just kind of all, again, just kind of like flowed together of coaching and my personal journey as well. And from there I went and um, earned my IFBB pro card in bikini in 2018 and have continued mentoring with different people over the years and improved my skill set with coaching and stuff and enjoyed my own personal experience of training as well and deep diving into the science of things. So that's kind of a, a short a little summary of where I'm, what's got me to where I'm at now. You're just going to say you skipped all the, over all the good stuff, Val. Like, geez. Like what? No, no N1 talk? How, how dare you? How did you meet those guys? Let's start oh. there. Yeah. So N1 education. Again, this was from my husband. So my husband's name is Ryan and he was working with Alan Cress um, about five or six years ago. And he, he said, you know, Alan, I, I see him working with the, these N1 people and they're going to be doing a practical at this prime fitness headquarters in Pennsylvania. Let's, let's sign you up to go. And I, you know, I looked at the cost and I was like, I, I don't really know how we can afford that. So my husband, so nice of him. He was like, I'll, I'll stop coaching with Alan. We'll save up some money. And so you can go to this. And that's what initially got me kickstarted into um, meeting Kasim Hansen and Adam and Cody. And um, I was just, so it was 2019 when I went to that first practical and I had done the online course that's required as a prerequisite to go. But again, like it was, it, this stuff was everything I'd been looking for. Cause I had been asking questions and drawing blanks. You know, I had um, go, t taken this like college, a sense, like in a sense, like a college prep course for the NASM certification and was not impressed. And my men my first mentor had told me that I didn't need any certifications in order to train at his gym. Like he would train me in the way that I needed to be trained. And it's like, even though he was telling me that I still felt like I needed these certifications. Um, 
But then as I started to learn from these certifications and things, um, I found out that they're more like a necessity if you're training at a gym and you get the real legitimate like biomechanics, nutritional information from people who are, who are living and breathing this stuff and who, you know, have a passion about it versus just a certification. So I get that. I'm not bad talking certifications. That's not my point here. I, I understand. I will. They're, they're I, I, will. I will as well. Yeah. Okay. NASM sucks. NASM sucks. So does the CSCS, so, anything like Val that. Val doesn't think so, but we know it's the truth. So. <laughs> well, I like, I actually, so, you know, I took that course, but I never took the test because I was just like, okay, now I see why Nick, my first mentor was like, you don't, you don't right. need this. Cause I was like, I don't, like, I don't really want my clients to le- really learn to like, like proprio- proprioception stuff. Like, I, I don't think that that really <laughs> really matters in the grand scheme of things <laughs> if they're trying to like get healthy and like maybe not fall down and break their hip yeah. as they get type of thing. Yeah. You know, so, mm-hmm. um, there was, there was that. So yeah, with, um, N1 education, it was seriously with those guys, it was just like, they were answering all the questions that I had been asking people and just like running in, you know, to dead ends, like dead end after dead end after dead end. And, and then even like my current coach that I had at the time when I've, first learned of n1 he would just get mad at me (laughs) so i'd ask a question and he'd be like why are you asking this this isn't what you know like (laughs) like the whole like ronnie coleman like da 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 like (laughs) look at what they did and i'm like well i don't want to be like ronnie coleman and like (laughs) like, that's not like really gonna work for me i don't like that she might be the first person i've ever said doesn't want to be ronnie coleman (laughs) <laughs> like she might I mean, I don't person. want to be like Ronnie Coleman. The guy can't even. Well, fucking I don't want to. I don't want to end up like Ronnie Coleman. Yes, but like Ronnie Coleman in his prime. I think every man that ever sees a video of Ronnie Coleman's like, okay, Ronnie Coleman. Yeah, I mean, he looked he looked great, but I and I'm I'm not gonna speak. You know, I don't know much about him or his past, but I feel like that was something that even people, as I was asking questions with other coaches and stuff, and trying to figure out where I wanted to take my journey and learn who I wanted to learn from that would be brought up a lot. And I was like, I, <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I don't know if that really, really has application to me. And I, don't, <laughs> I know who he is and I think he's a great guy, but I, I don't like that. You mean you don't want to go around the gym yelling lightweight baby and just getting <laughs> everyone staring at you. I mean, come on. Oh. Seems well, like now a dream. I'm the gym and I'm like, mm-hmm. I was going to say you are a uh, very, animated in the gym aren't you Val yeah I like to dance it's really yeah. fun even <laughs> if it's all dancing so yeah so with n1 education um took that first course and I was four weeks out from my second bikini pro show and so I was like really low carbs which you shouldn't do when you're when no you, you went to their practical four weeks out of a show uh-huh yeah I did was oh, it four days Lord. then too what did you say? Was it a four day practical then too? No, it was three. It was three oh. back then. Oh. But I, I was <laughs> cold, you know, like low body fat. So I was like really cold. And then I got like sick because I wasn't eating enough. So Can't imagine like, why. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And so I had this like moment one day where they were walking through, it was like chest stuff and I didn't really know them. Right. I hadn't met them like didn't feel like a good connection because it was like my second day of meeting them. But I knew Alan because he was working, he had worked with Ryan. And so I like go over to Alan. I'm like, I I'm shaking and I'm really cold. What do I do? And he was like, you need to eat food. He's like, what are your carbs at? And I was like, I'm eating a hundred carbs right now. And he goes, you, you need to eat more food. And so I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't care that I am prep if I want to like make this worthwhile and I also don't want to pass out, I'm going to go eat. So I had <laughs> granola in my car, just, you know, like, is it called granola? Tromix. I had Tromix in my car. And even though he told me to eat carbs, I inhaled this bag of Tromix that I had purchased from Target. <laughs> I just ate the whole thing. And a couple of hours later, Kasten was like, so what did you choose for your carbs? I'm like, well, I actually ate trail mix. And he goes, that's a lot of fats, but okay, whatever. <laughs> and that was my first experience of like really learning about nutrition. <laughs> as oh, well. nice. I was just like, 
stuff the car or the 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 trail mix in my yep. face all the fats <laughs> and so that's what I did and I felt great it still worked it was I, it was good and then I from there I went on and um have worked with Adam and Cody they were my coaches and mentors um for like two and a half years and just as a couple uh like two months ago I'm I'm now coaching on my own and just doing consulting so I've nice taken things on on my own and yeah so n1 has played a massive role in my in my progress in my journey in my experience um it's fun because i can you know go to the, them and ask them questions and they will absolutely rabbit hole with me about different things and i love that so what are you think like the three top three things you've taken from them that's been able to help you as a coach I, I think with helping with coaching, it's been being able to take the complex subjects, the complex information that they, you know, that they have and share and find the ways to break it down for my clients, for just, you know, the, the mom who's looking to get toned and doesn't need to know about abduction at adduction it's just like you know tell me how to set up so that i can feel and like or not even necessarily feel so i can train in a way that's appropriate where i won't get injured um the next thing would be like nutrition nutrition timing and optimizing that a little bit more i know optimization sometimes gets a bad rap but i think that there's a lot of value in finding ways to optimize so not only with the training and better quality exercise selection, but with nutrition and finding a little bit better timing, understanding where carbohydrates play a role that, you know, you need enough fats too. Cause there were so many years that in my initial journey where my fats just always stayed really, really low and understanding their benefits for hormone health, especially for women and not just always eating peanut butter, <laughs> <laughs> having a variety of fats. So new nutritional timing and the importance of those things. And then also periodization with programming, a big takeaway that I've learned from N1 has been uh, training periodization. So looking at, you know, a, a macro cycle and how, depending on the client's goal, you're going to take them through a fat loss phase. And cause it used to be where it would just be, you know, just a program. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like a lot of people do that and they do these natural deloads within a, within their, their program where they might just do lower volume or they go on vacation and they don't train during that time, but taking, taking you out of a certain type of training stimulus and deloading from that. So like giving your nervous system a break and training other systems in the body for a week or, or two or whatever it might be like that provides so much, um, opportunity for progression when you go back into whatever it is is your your main goal so while some may feel that it's like a regression it's just this opportunity to push yourself even that much further and you're training other systems in the body while you're doing it so um yeah th i think those would be the the three things my yep. three top takeaways what is what is your favorite way to deload from like a tension-based cycle or like hypertrophy stuff do you go into like more neurological or do you prefer to do like the metabolic type stuff well if you're doing tension work for building or if you're doing tension work for fat loss building for building so mm -hmm. if you're focused on, for hypertrophy you're doing tension and you need to move into a deload it could be a lower volume tension phase but if you're looking to increase insulin sensitivity, you might want to do some more metabolic type of work. And whether that's doing some more local metabolic type of training or things where you want to train more of this, like the whole systems, you know, like systemic work of, of the body. Um, that's also like something you would take into consideration. What, what do you feel like you might need a little bit more of like, do you find yeah. that you're winded as you're hitting your failure steps or whatever, and you need to work a little bit more from the cardio endurance perspective and increase like efficiency, um, 
in the, you know, the energy cell or the energy systems of the cells, mm -hmm. then you might want to do that over like local metabolic pumpy type of stuff. Do you have like a preference that you use with like general population people that you're like, okay, we kind of need to build this groundwork first and then you have kind of a system that you build upon or is everything that you do very individualized? It's very individualized. So I, when a new client comes on, I look at what they've been doing, what their ultimate goal is, where they're currently training. I ask them about past dieting and things like that. And a lot like, you know, I work with women for like it's now all women. The only person, the only guy that I program for is my husband. <laughs> right <laughs> now. Um, but so my, these women that I work with, a lot of them love cardio. So a lot of them are runners and will do type of stuff like that. And so if I were to put them into a systemic phase and didn't give them enough, um, like volume in a systemic type of training phase, they're going to get nothing out of that because they're already so cardiovascularly conditioned that it will be kind of a waste of time. They won't, their heart rate won't get up. And, and this is stuff I learned early on when I was, um, you know, learning these things. And then, cause I had a marathon runner and I gave her systemic work and she was like, everything you're telling me, I'm supposed to be feeling like I'm not feeling. <laughs> and, and so it was one of those things of like, Oh, okay. So if I'm going to do this, I actually need to keep her away from that type of training longer. So she can actually get adaptations in that when I need her to. So I had to pull her out of that. And then it was like months later, I was able to take her in that, but I still have to do higher volume, short rest, shorter rest intervals. And I have clients like that to this day, but it's just become, you know, like a second nature thing. Like I just, I just know, like based on their history that when it, when I put them in this type of stuff, I've got to be like, I like their type of systemic training is going to be way different from somebody who's been sitting on the couch or has a sedentary job and doesn't really move that much or get their heart rate up that often. So have to take those considerations into account. What is the amount of volume that they can actually recover from where you won't, they won't end up barfing because you've right. <laughs> overloaded their liver. <laughs> <laughs> you mean that's what happens when that happens? You're not supposed to feel nauseous. I know. It's like this, uh, sometimes people wear that as a badge of honor, like uh -huh. leg day just crushed me. I was over in the, in the bathroom, just barfing away. And yeah. I'm like, oh, mm. you had some like other things you probably should have worked on. So you didn't barf. <laughs> yeah. I try to tell clients when I do them systemic stuff, I'm like, if you hit the nostrils point, you've gone too far. Mm -hmm. And then usually when they feel it, it's because, you know, it's, it's the delay. Like you can feel it coming on. And then like 10 minutes later it hits and you're like, oh shit, what just happened? right oh uh, that's the worst feeling in the world oh it, it is it is terrible it is yucky have you ever had like so you're training and then like the blood like blood sugar crash like all of a sudden you're feeling lightheaded so you're like what do i do that's not fun crispies rice krispies that's what you do like <laughs> i i carry around an emergency bag of swedish or not swedish fish cinnamon nice. um cinna dragons so not nice. cinnamon bears, cinna dragons from trade. Cinna dragons. I have to try those sometime. Drop those in my face when I start to feel. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have one of these ladies that likes to do a bunch of recreational stuff like running or probably hiking because you're in the mountains and different stuff like that. And then they say, Val, I want to build muscle. How do you get somebody like that who's probably in a calorie deficit most of the time already into an actual like hypertrophy phase? Yeah. Like the client buy-in it's huge. Cause you want, I mean, they, they always tell you, I'm sure you hear this from your clients too. Like, well, I trust you. And I'm like, Hey man, like, I'm glad that you trust me, but you got to trust yourself. And I'm going to like explain to you why we're going to move into what we're doing. I don't just want you to like move in with trust. Like I want to educate you on the process so that buy-in is higher. And so somebody who's come, who comes to me in a deficit, and I feel like I've done a good job, um, especially the last year with explaining things and using my personal experience. And then like from other clients too, because when I get clients that hire me, like they already know, they already know that I'm not going to eat, make them eat food to the point where they get fat. Like, I feel like that's something that a lot of women have said to me in the past of like, well, you know, like, am I going to get fat? Am I going to get fat eating these calories? And my response is like, I, you know, like 
I wouldn't be doing what I was doing if I just got all my clients fat. I wouldn't get re referrals and recommendations. <laughs> like that's not the point, you know? And I'm definitely watching what your your weekly check-ins and your circumference measurements and your biofeedback, like I'm watching all of that, but I have never like made somebody fat. Like that's not something that I do. <laughs> I'm not like a fat building coach. <laughs> Nobody is, right? Nobody's a fat right. building coach. So um that buy-in is is huge and just educating them on like okay this is what you've done it hasn't worked this is what you're looking for toned the toned word you want to be toned <laughs> got to build muscle and over time it will be less body fat too to show off the muscles you know all the shape that yeah. the muscles get and it just takes time and it does take food so we're gonna you know you have to manage your recovery figure out how many days you actually need to train, make sure when you're training that it's like more worthwhile and you're not just in there running around and doing burpees in between sets and <laughs> you know, the different things that sometimes people like to do because they just want to feel sweaty and like they've got a good workout and, you know, find other ways for them to challenge themselves besides just like, did you get sweaty today? Because that's, not going to be a good indicator of a good workout or soreness, you know? So right. I think the client education is huge so that they do have the buy-in and realize that it's not a quick fix and what they've done in the past maybe wasn't, maybe has worked, maybe not going to be the best for long-term progress for the, their goals that they really want, which is toned. That's like the toned. Right. The, the thing that doesn't exist that everybody knows about. Yeah. <laughs> they all say it still. So yeah, like, no. Yeah, it's amazing. So I know when I get women who want to get in better shape and I start giving them carbohydrates, the biggest thing I've always heard is I feel fluffy. The <laughs> and, word fluffy. Yeah. And I'm like, well, but nothing's really changing. Like your body is just getting nutrients that it needs. And so do you deal with things like that? Or how do you deal with something like that? Or how would you deal with something like that? all the time oh my goodness all the time so fluffy yep. it's like i i actually a, a couple months ago i was like fluffy is a state of mind like you you're not fluffy you're not you're not a blankie you're not like your <laughs> it's little blankie you're not um a teddy bear that's soft and fluffy you know those right. type of things it's it's just this this thing that we like this perception that we give to ourselves, Um, and I believe it's because we're doing something we've never done before in the way of nutrition. And so we're eating more food and that feels scary because of this dialogue that is consistent, like consistently pushed upon us of like leaner is better. Um, you know, low carbs are bad or like you want to have low carbs, high carbs are bad, you know, only eat, um, you know, fruit. Well, it's like, there's always these like different stories that we're hearing that are being told that are all, all myths. Like I think everything in moderation is important, but again, in moderation, even fat loss in moderation, like you want to spend right. more time living in maintenance than you do fat loss. And so when it comes to people saying fluffy, it's just like trying to show them the big the big picture and giving them that objective view. So I will often like with my clients be like, okay, this is where and I, the visual picture is, is huge. Here you are right now. This is where you were six weeks ago when you start, like when you started, like look at yourself, you look right. awesome. There's no change or maybe there is even change. If you have your clients tracking circumference measurements, mm -hmm. there's times that their waist has come down like right. a half inch, a quarter inch, sometimes even a full inch. If you know, it's a bunch of inflammation has come off, but they're eating more food. And so when they see that you can't, um, you can't argue with like, of like a visual change of your, <laughs> of your body, you know? And so it's just, they're, they're like, Oh my goodness. It, it like, it, it's all the time. I'd had no idea. And I'm like, yeah, you look fantastic. So right. like, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we all, we all I guess we all kind of go like, 
after Thanksgiving, when I eat a lot of food, like I kind of feel fluffy for a second, but. Well, I'm sure you could relate like being depleted before you get on stage and then you fill up with carbohydrates. I think that's what they're feeling. And they're considering that as being fluffy. And I'm like, no, those are just full muscles. Like, that's what that is. Like, yeah. sorry, you have some body fat that's covering them. So you can't actually see them yet, but it's probably what's filling is up as the muscles with glycogen. And now you can like do stuff. Yeah. And you know, if you have them tracking their, their weight, their weight could maybe have gone up a few pounds, which is also like, can be that scary feeling and kind of right. play into that narrative of like, I'm getting fatter, but it's like, no, you're just like eating more carbohydrates, fuller muscles, a little bit more water in the muscles due to your food. And it's fantastic. That brings up to another good point. So you have people track all the time. How much weight fluctuation do you see on from like a day to day or even week to week basis with clients? Because I know that is like a big thing, especially when people have these body composition goals where they're like, oh my God, it's going the wrong way, blah, blah, blah. And I like, I know pounds. you follow Tiana on Instagram and you're friends with her, right? She does a really good job of explaining this, like, hey, these things are going to happen. But I'm um, in your clients, you, I'm sure you notice the same thing, right? Yes. Tiana, I love you. So me and Tiana, we are like, we talk to each other on a weekly basis and just give ourselves like, she gives me feedback. I give her feedback. So right now we're, it's, it's kind of fun nice. uh, seeing how she's doing, but yeah. So she's a really great example of like, Hey, right now, I mean, she's also a crazy example of how much food somebody can eat. Like it's <laughs> my mind. She almost eats as much as I do some days. She is. And, and right now she's at like, you know, she's nearing the end of her building season. She's been in a build for since February, I think of this year. So she's going, she's, she's up there with her food. It's, in, it's incredible. I think she's at That's like working. The, Did you see that picture she posted yesterday? Yeah, she, like, holy I shit. was privileged enough. She sent it to me before she put it on oh. her Insta. <laughs> <laughs> Val gets exclusive access. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, she's up to like 3,400 calories a day, you guys. So that's, she's pretty unique and, and incredible, but she brings up a good point of like, when you're eating more food, your weight's going to come up. And, and so we see these weight fluctuations and she's very transparent with it, which I think is fantastic because it helps people to realize like, yeah, you eat more food. There's going to be a good possibility. You're going to put on weight. You're not going to like, I feel like people feel they should eat more food and somehow lose weight, you know? And we see that happen sometimes where right. it appears as though, by eating more food, you're losing weight, but there's all these other variables that are happening beneath that we don't get to see. Right. But, sure. um, people always want to be that person, but with, even with my clients, the ones that there's some people who like to track every single day and there's others who will weigh in once a week, um, others who will never weigh in. And so everybody has, a um, their own preference. And, you know, if people have an emotional attachment to the scale, it's definitely like throw that out. Like there's no reason to have that extra stress in your life. But if it's something you can use and you can watch the fluctuations in your weight and see the trends that happen over time, like with women pre-menstrual, it's like for some five or six pounds up, like that's just what some of my clients do. Others, nothing happens, but for the average, it's a few pounds, like you're going to maintain a little bit more water around your cycle. And it could be pre menstrual. It could be once you start your period. And so you have to take that into account of like, that's just like the normal ebb and flow of being a woman. You have that, that comes into play. And then you look at things like if you go out to dinner, um, you know, and you're still tracking as best you can, but it's more eyeballing if you're eating out, um, you know, that's like you, you don't know how much sodium that they use. You don't know if things like how much oil things were cooked in, if any. And so the next day you might step on the scale and it might be up a couple pounds, but it's like, logically, you got to think of it of like, this is what I did last night. So yeah, it makes sense that it'll be up a couple pounds, but if I get back on track, things will get, you know, back into the progress that, or the direction that I'm going at, at that time. So yeah. Right. You uh, made me think of another good question. So, so with training women and they're around their cycles, do you have these special micro cycles that you have for their 
weeks that they are menstruating or they're not? Or is that like a myth that people are latching on to? Well, I don't think it's a myth necessarily, because I do know like some people get like really they, like they can get really sick feeling and really crampy and stuff. But I feel like if your periods are so bad or your premenstrual symptoms are that bad, where it's like debilitating, that that should be something you look into because that's that's not normal. Like you shouldn't have like one week out of a month where you are like sick to your stomach and like possibly even throwing up sometimes like that shouldn't be happening. There's something that you need to work on. <laughs> so you should go figure that out. And, but um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of training or, or nutrition around your cycle. I just don't think that that's necessary because I feel like it can become a crutch sometimes like sure. We'll have cravings. Like I even get cravings, but I feel like the more educated I am on how my body works, the more I can be prepared and on top of things. So it's like, if I know that right now it's like PMS week for me or whatever, and I'm feeling like I can like double check. Cause I use my aura ring and track my body temperature. So I know when my body temperature spikes that I'm ovulating those type of things, as long as I'm like aware of what's going on, then I can like be ahead of the curve mm -hmm. in case something you know, in case I feel like I like need to eat a bunch of crackers or something like that. Like if I'm feeling like I'm craving salty stuff, I could just be like, okay, I know why I know I am craving salty stuff, or I know why I'm being snappy at my, at my boys and yelling at them or whatever. <laughs> so it's like, calm down, Val, calm down, but I'm not going to go out of my way to totally change things up. It just gives me more awareness around it. Um, a, a big thing too, is like energy energy can tank for some people. And that happens to me too. But I often find that I, in, instead of letting it be a crutch and being like, Oh, like, I don't have like the motivation and I'm tired today. And this is why, like, I know this is why it's like, okay, this means I need to dig even deeper. Like I want to push myself and I want to see if I can hit a PR on my leg press today or something like that. And it's usually like I do. And I think that's power um, that shows the power the mind has that, you know, even though that there's like these things that are happening, like these physiological things that are happening to me, like I can still push hard and it, it's empowering and it, you know, it gives me a little energy boost. So I don't, I don't like to do that with my clients, but I do like to help them to bring awareness to it. So it's like, we'll track things. So, you know, when it's happening, so you can put some things in place for when you're starting to feel like this. And so you, it's not just like this ravenous binge fest that comes out of nowhere, if you can help it. I mean, that does happen to some <laughs> women. You get right. those, check, you know, you, I'm sure you do too. You get those check-ins where they're like, uh, I ate the whole sleeve of Oreos last night or whatever. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I do that on a nightly basis and it's not because I'm on my period. So <laughs> I think, you know, I, I understand. <laughs> what? I don't believe it. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I, I try not to, but sometimes, uh, um, so you mentioned hitting PRs. Now you don't necessarily train people all the time with like the big barbell or compound movements, but you're having them track personal records on different movements to show progress and different things like that. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. Nice. And so do you find, cause it sounds like you have people track a lot of different things. Do you find that makes it much easier for them to start seeing the wins that they have? before they see the big result at the end, right? Because oh, like when you're starting at point A and you're trying to get to point B, you have to have markers along the way to kind of help you stay on track. You should yes, think. yes, absolutely. 100%. Because it's not all about, I mean, ultimately it's the, the physique change. People want the physique change. But in order to get the physique change, they're like, it's a, it's a long-term situation here like it's not something um that just even in a few years that people can achieve a certain result and so you are looking at wins along the way and it's going to come from better habits with nutrition better habits with sleep checking the boxes with daily steps um things in the gym like that's like huge so different ways that you can find wins in the gym 
whether it's hitting a, a PR, like, you know, just trying to lift a little bit more load than you had before, or um, like whatever it might be, just those ways of finding those improvements, 100%. Like, I think it's uh, really good and motivating to see progress along the way that helps you as you're getting to these big, these big goals that do take years. What, what's some, what are some realistic timelines on things like that? Because you hear people all the time that come into the gym and they get in that mindset of, I want this, I want this, I want the results. I want it now. I want this. So what's, what are some kind of like realistic and like expectations and timelines that people should have in their mind for some of these body changes or body composition changes that they're looking for? If it's weight loss or if it's shaping their body to look a, a certain way, how long do those things usually take to try to hopefully make people understand like this is a, this is a big process and a big journey. This isn't just going to happen overnight. So what are, yeah. what are some of the, like, what, what, what are the timelines that you're looking at for people usually, or how long do you tell people like this, this is going to take a little bit? Yeah. Well, I, it, as far as like a specific timeline, that's really hard to say because you're looking at the effort of the client and what they can actually like manageably achieve given their other like things that are happening in their life. Right. And so like how much effort can they actually put into this? They're not, you know, most people aren't going to be like us where it's like, this is what we live and breathe. And, you know, I can specifically, like I make a point to go to the gym at a certain time of the day when the gym is the least crowded. So I can do whatever I want when I'm there. I'm not, I can't, it's not like I have to go at six o'clock when everybody, is, you know, like when the gym's busy and I'm not going at five o'clock when the gym is busy. So, um, it's like, well, what can we manage like reasonably expect and manage those expectations within these parameters that you have set forth that like, these are like, you have non-negotiables, everybody has their non-negotiables. So what is it that we have to work with in? And then we set those parameters and we're like, okay, so this is, the way that we're going to manage your expectations on this journey. Um, for some people, it's like, I, I do not want to track macros and it's like, okay, you're going to be a fat loss. You don't want to track macros. We're going to look at different ways that we can do this. We need to find a way that works best for you. And again, if you're not tracking, you're not going to be as, um, you know, you're not going to be able to fast track that experience as somebody who's like tracking all the macros. And it's not that one is better than the other per se. It's, it's just like, okay, if you're a person that came from an eating disordered past and macro tracking is going to trigger those feelings. Yeah. We're not, we're not even going to go down that road. Like that's not even an option. That is a non-negotiable. So we have to manage those expectations, figure out what works and move forward from there. <clears throat> but you know, other people who are like, I train from home, but I have like the most perfect gym with all the equipment and I, I don't mind tracking my macros. And if you want me to do like meal timing and nutrition timing and specific carbs around my, like, they're going to see progress more fast, like more quickly than the person who's like, I work, um, you know, I, it, I take an hour to commute into the city each day. I work until five o'clock and then it's an hour and a half commute back because there's more traffic and I get 45 minute window of training around my lunchtime each day. I mean, that's all you got to work with. You know, you want to make sure that you're managing their recovery because they obviously have a high stress job. You want to see what you can do to get them moving more because it sounds like they're pretty busy and commuting in the car or traffic or, you know, train or whatever. So you just like have to take all those considerations and be like, what makes the most sense? And, you know, typically as a coach, you want to, under promise and over deliver. So if you set those timelines a little bit longer, like say, let's like say, you know, like in a year, this is where we want to see you. If it happens sooner, that's fantastic. And so keeping those expectations like a little bit lower and being realistic about the process. And if things happen faster than that, then nobody, like nobody's going to care. Everybody's going to be happier about that experience. And oftentimes that does happen because people start to get better at checking the big rocks. You know, they're, they get better at managing their sleep 
um, hygiene routine, or they get better at maybe packing some celery sticks or whatever and snacking on that versus having a bag of chips from the vending machine. So it's just like these little habits that um, help improve their overall quality of life, which help them to get to their goal a little bit faster. But yeah, managing those expectations um, and just like helping them to figure out what what they can actually do um, is is huge. So, you know, I'm a coach that works with clients for for years. Like they stay with me for a long time and we go through lots of different periods of building and cutting and um, improving mindset. Like I feel like, you know, I'm sure you guys get that too. Mindset's a big, a big thing because um, people just always want to be leaner and they feel like they need to eat less and they get that, that, you know, they're like two months into eating a little bit more food and then they feel fluffy and then they go back into a diet. And so it's like, you got to just push through the fluff feeling. And then you, it's like magic that happens over there. That is 100% true. Yep. That happened to me. I got like what I thought was fluffy and now I almost have abs again. I'm like, what the hell happened here? The weight didn't even change. Like, Pretty cool when everything like- catches up. Yeah. And so it's like, you just sit in it a little bit longer. It might feel a little bit uncomfortable, but you're looking at other wins. So it's like, like we were just talking about, like, look at those PRs that you're hitting at the gym, like challenge yourself there instead of focusing so much on like, do I have abs this morning? They were there (laughs) last week. Why are they not here this week? It's like, they'll show up again or, or whatever it might be. You know, right. if you want your delts to pop, it's like, they'll show up again. Just give it some time and focus on getting strong. Like feeling that feeling of being strong, you know, like, I know I can't lift as much as you guys, but I'm, I feel strong in my true. own way. I'm pretty sure I- you can do way more on that multi-hip than I can. Oh. <laughs> that well, thing's fucking, oh my God. I watch you guys do that between like you and Tiana. I'm like, um, yeah, I got some work to do. So thanks ladies. <laughs> looking out you're like yeah we added the extra pin and then put 245s on it plus the whole stack i'm like what (laughs) like what are you talking about like you were joking about doing irm work for hip flexion on that thing and i'm like no i really do that and i think i use like 85 pounds maybe like it's so hard so so hard oh my gosh yeah well it, it's like we got the glute stuff on lock, but I'm sure you guys have like the chest and the squat stuff on lock. I don't know if I have anything on lock. I, Miller does. I ask Miller. I just yeah. say, hey, Adam, how do I make this better? <laughs> <laughs> so back to the glute stuff. If I want to know, like, what are your top two exercises for glutes? And like, if you could throw one away and never have to see anybody do it again, which one would that be? Um. The good old cable rope pull through, I that needs to get thrown away. <laughs> there is, there's no, uh, it's I, it's just a waste of time. I'm not even gonna cherry. <laughs> She's gonna make. Do a you lot think of- it could be good for the posterior chain, not necessarily just the glutes? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> You're like, nope, just throw She's that one gonna away. make a there. lot of West Side people mad right now. Yeah, well, that. Louis didn't really know what he was doing, so it's okay. <laughs> That's like a staple in all those programs, though, all yeah, the, the banded pull-throughs. <laughs> I'm kind of with her because I tried it for a little while, and it didn't do shit. So yeah, no. I was like, I'm good on this. Thanks. It's just, I I mean, people do it all the time, but it re- I, mm-hmm. I, it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of your energy <laughs> and and then you look kind of weird doing it too. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's that, but, um, yeah, it's a waste of time and energy when you could really like get into some solid positions where you're loading the glutes, like make more out of the time that you have when you're at the gym. Cause most people don't have like hours upon hours to do, you know, to do stuff. So, I mean, good, good glute exercises are going to be like, a uh, leg press you, your spine's not loaded and you can lift a lot heavier in a leg press versus doing a squat. And so I like leg presses and then you've got variations of kickbacks and I've very much enjoyed the higher pulley height press backs, calling Mm -hmm. them the press back because you can press down and then back. Yeah. Where do you get those attachments so you can kick into it like that? So, do the do the fight gear ones work well enough for that? You know yeah. that they do. 
Yeah. And I know like IPR fitness makes some, there's so many different, you know, random off brands at the, on Amazon, but finding like a good quality brand where the Velcro doesn't come apart is something that like, I've reached out to a few companies in the United States to try to make my own, but, um, every time I, I start, I'm like, this is kind of what I want to do. I haven't told them my design, but both of them said they were, they were like, well, I'm, we're making something like that. And I'm like, I feel like you're making something like that. Cause I just told you. Right. And they're like, thanks for the good idea, Val. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, I, I know, know like the ones Kaz had at the, at, and one where you, you know it goes under your foot and hooks on the toe so you can actually press into it like you're talking about that's what i was trying to mimic yeah so they're like yeah the fight the fight tech brand um but they've been used like the ones that Cassim has at the hq they've been used so much by so many people because they you know they have all these people coming in out that the the velcro isn't that great and he, you know oh, that, okay. that was his thing is he's he's working on seeing about getting um, some as well. And For so, sense. yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm like trying to figure out a good, a good thing there. Cause I've gone through, I've ripped a few and broke, broke a few. Cause when you are lifting over a hundred pounds with a press back, that's kind of scary. And then, and then it breaks and that's happened a couple times. How do you get a good stable setup for that? Especially if you're going that heavy. It's so what I like to do is once I get buckled in, then I bring my foot down to the ground. So both my feet are on the ground and I get into position. So I adjust my, my feet into position. And the reason why I'm telling you guys that is because I do see people who will want to stand on a plate or um, some sort of box because they don't like the foot that's working, you know, the kicking foot to touch the ground. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is by doing that, it it doesn't really help improve the setup. Mm -hmm. It just makes it a little bit more in like not stable because you don't really know where you're going to place your standing leg and foot until you get everything all set up. So that's why I like to bring my foot down and then I get supported with my feet. As far as my hands, you definitely want to be holding onto something with both of your hands. You won't be able right. to do like one hand at a time that will just be all over the place. And so that is, um, again, like there is instability that comes with doing press backs because you don't have your hips supported. And so being able to get the setup as best as you can with a nice sturdy strap around your ankle and stuff is really going to help. And, um, but that's, you know, when you, that's why it's nice to do leg press because everything's nice and supported or 45 hip extensions or things like that, where you've got that hip support. Right. Yeah, the more stable it is, the heavier you can possibly load it. Yes, as long as yeah, you don't. And then if you're fancy and have cool stuff like Chasm does, you can load the shit out of it. Oh, but yeah. none of us have those cool things. Well, some people do. Do you have any of his cool toys, or is that just Lindsay that has all the cool stuff? Yeah, Lindsay has. She has an, a bigger, a nice home gym. With some and she's got the hack squat and all kinds of stuff. Well, you have a nice setup too. You have the prime prodigy cage and all that stuff, don't you? I have that, but I don't have any other machines. Like we just don't have, when we right. built this house, you know, 12 years ago, neither of us were super into strength training. And so, and I don't, I don't really want to move either. So we just, well, you just need your own gym then. I know. Cause you're starting to do courses and stuff, aren't you? I am looking into doing some like some glute camps and I put it, I put feelers out there just the other day on my stories and I had, I had like an overwhelming response of people. You didn't, who, you didn't think you would? No, I really, really? did. Every I was, girl wants a nice butt. Glute. I was, that's a, that's a blown, great market. I was blown away. And so now I'm trying to figure out how to make it happen. Cause um, yeah, like over a hundred, a hundred people all over the country and up that's in awesome. Canada. Yeah, like I don't get that many people that talk to me that often. So when people, oh really? Like, yeah, <laughs> like I get like the like I do. I'm really good at you know talking to people in my DMs, but like that much of a response, right? One day for me was a lot, and so yeah, people are like come to Oregon, come to New Jersey, come to Toronto, come to Florida, come to Tennessee, and come to Texas. I'm like, okay, I will come, 
but you guys need to help me. Cause I don't right. know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Like you need to find people to make sure people will actually show up right. and help me find gyms that I can do this stuff at. So it's a little bit, been a little bit overwhelming, but we'll see, we'll see what I can do from this. I would love to do some glute caps. I think it would be really, really fun. How many people showed up to yours and Lindsay's seminar? Was that a seminar or biomechanics camp? What was that? It was a hypertrophy camp. And so we discussed, um, you know, what hypertrophy is and then went through some different exercise exercises on the floor and um, with different muscle groups. So we did some arm stuff, back, um, a little bit of legs and hit, taking some things to failure. So it was just one day. I believe there was 13 women that came oh, wow. to the camp and it was a full day long camp. And we obviously went over. How could you not? <laughs> how, how exhausted did you feel at the end of that? So exhausted, but crazy, it was, right? But yeah, crazy, it was right? So fun though. It's like, yes. like being able to work with, you know, people in person, which you guys do you both of you guys get to do that, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah is so like I love it and I I just don't get that um experience so it's all you know all online of what I do some people will come and train at my home but again I just have limited equipment and so it's not quite the same as all of that equipment that you have and also people who are coming seeking knowledge from you on certain certain topics so that's also really fun to be able Sounds to like do. another reason you guys need a gym can just host seminars in utah that would be way better yeah right i mean i hosted one here and it was exhausting but it was fun yeah and i mad respect for chasm for doing it for four days in a row i have no idea how the hell that guy does that i'd be dead it's like <clears throat> mental, yeah to be able to to be on and because it is it's like exhausting it's it's very exhausting in a good way yeah it's, it's not a bad thing at all but it takes a lot of energy and you're like, holy moly, like what just happened? So what are you going to do your next? Camp? I don't know. I have no idea. Come See you on. in Missouri. See you in Missouri. Nobody's going to go to Missouri, Nathan. Well, we're trying to figure out the details. It's called but... misery for a reason. They, have, they Maybe. might come to Missouri. We can, we, can, we can get Val to come and she can do a day and then you can have your day. We could make it a whole You need a functional experience. trainer, bro. You don't even uh, have a functional if trainer. You, if, you come, if you commit to coming, I'll buy one today. Today. You'll buy one today? today. Will you buy the Prime one today? No, I'm not spending that kind of money. But <laughs> that thing is insane, though. So nice. It's so nice. Yeah. Those absolutely. kickbacks on that one are a breeze, right, Val? <laughs> yeah, they're they're nice. But any like any functional trainer, um, like it works. You can make. I mean, I work out at an EOS gym, so a, a box gym, and it's like Matrix equipment even like the cable machines. I think there's a few life fitness cables, but matrix. That is true. Like that is mad respect, Val. Way to, way to crush it in a box gym like that. That is, I so, didn't even consider that. That's, there's no way I could ever do that. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like I work, I, I train on like the worst equipment ever. And yeah, I you went to the shitty golds I used to work at. <laughs> it was fun. I like it there. It's, it's, eh, it's okay. <laughs> The, the free motion cables they have are amazing. That's for sure. I wanted to take those for the longest time. Those things are so nice. Yeah, those are good. But yeah, you can't beat the HQ. It's super cool. No, Nathan has yet to ever go there. I showed him it while he was out here. I was like, see that building with nothing on it? That's where all the magic happens. <laughs> it is a special building. It's on the list for sure. Got to get out there. I always wonder, like, every time I go to one of those and, like, there's new people, I'm like, did you not think anything was here? They're like, yeah, I didn't know where I was going. I'm like... Yeah, it's kind of how it's like Fight Club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you open it up and it's like, oh. <laughs> now you've been to multiple practicals, Val. Do you learn something new every time you go? I do. And not necessarily from like a biomechanics perspective, but um, just in ways that I can better train my clients and mm -hmm. like educate them on how to set up with, with things. So that was especially true um the last the last couple of times I've been you've it's been just, to the program design one as well right yeah so How I was went that one I went to the first one in 2019 or 2000 yeah 2019 and then 
I went to the their most recent one in February. And so it was it was good. Yeah. Is, how does I guess what are, I did you do the progressive overload one too? Probably. I'm trying to remember because I know I met you at the the weird one that Dustin was doing with like the member with like the Eastern medicine stuff. Yeah. The... So he was doing like the PNF, right? I think that's what it's called so. where you will like touch different points. Touch yeah, yeah. The meridian body. points and all that different stuff. Open things up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So no. Okay. So then it was Lindsay. I met at the progressive overload one. Okay. They did. There's so many of them. I go to all the obscure ones that are cheaper because I'm cheap like that. <laughs> yeah i don't know okay i'm like i don't know i've been to a lot yeah that's fair and assisted but... uh, uh, shadowed at a lot as well nice yeah nathan do you have any more questions i i, th I was gonna ask, say like one of the biggest problems i have with clients is uh convincing them that they do get to eat actually eat the amount of calories that they get to eat so how do you go about helping people kind of repattern that thought process of oh i i'm probably not even adequately eating enough to survive my day and now you're telling me i need to get to this amount of calories and it just seems so overwhelming for them so how do you it's kind of curious how you go about that process of helping people kind of reprogramming to like i can eat more and i'm still gonna lose weight believe it or not and people really struggle with that concept of like because they've had so much diet culture thrown down their face i feel like they're like I have to eat less to lose more. And it's just not the case. Yeah, it's, it's huge. But again, the diet, the diet, mindset. people just don't stop with that. It's <laughs> it terrible. Helps. Yeah. And one, one thing that really helps is they're like training. It's going to improve your training performance. You're going to get better sleep. So you, you find areas, um, you know, in your assessment with them where they are struggling outside of just the, like the training and nutrition. And it, it, it could be like, uh, like a lot of people struggle with sleep. And so that's something where it's like, you know, when you're eating more food, you'll be able to sleep better. You won't be waking up as much during the night because your body will be able to sleep through the night. It won't be waking you up to try to get these little spikes of, of glucose to help with detoxification during the night and things like that. And, um, and then with training, you can look at the training aspect and be like more food, better training. You want muscle, more food, better training. <laughs> and you, and so you can lift heavier. You're going to have better energy and it's going to, you know, when you train and get stronger, you're going to feel better. So the, like those type of things, um, I think helps with, with the buy-in of like, Hey, it's good to eat food. <laughs> Your is food is not bad, like at all. Um, and carbs, especially, and you, it, you could even go with like, okay, we're going to start by eating a little bit more carbohydrate around your training and then adjust to increasing over other meals too, but just starting a little bit smaller where it maybe doesn't seem as overwhelming to them mm -hmm. with eating a little bit more, but that that's a really hard mental hurdle for people to get through. And there, there has to come a point where they trust them themselves enough to be able to let go the, like, when the mindset is holding them back and they're constantly thinking negative things, I've just seen so much like lack or stalled progress because they won't allow themselves to do, to do that thing. Yeah. Um, they're like, they are what's holding them back. Yep. So, Almost like, like we're our own worst enemies, right? Yep. Yeah. And so it's like, it takes a while. You may need to, you know, tough love. I, I think coaches can be really good at doing yeah. this. And there so, yeah. And you're like, come on, you, you got this, you know, constantly reminding them like, this is what you asked, you know, like, this is your, this is your goal. This is why you came to me. This is one, one piece of the puzzle that we need to work on in order to get to this, 
final this uh I don't want to say final destination because again I feel like it's just this is a lifelong journey but to get to your next step for you to start seeing the physical progress you're looking for you need to get through this hurdle so yeah. that brings up a good point so you would say what you're coaching people on is how to create a optimized lifestyle to give them like a better quality of life and allow them to do it as whatever they want to do with it right yeah and with that will come periods where they're going to have uh, way more flexibility with things, but they've built these habits around stuff. So they're not always going to be wanting to be in the gym and pushing for PRs, but they just have this habit of going to the gym because they know it's it's good to have like muscle is is good for your body and you start to lose muscle as you get older. So having this consistent habit of hitting the gym, even if it's just three times a week, it doesn't have to be four or five but you have that habit. And then same thing with the habits of like, just making sure you're eating enough protein. And if you start, you know, after a few months of not tracking or something like that, and you're starting to feel like, oh, my pants are getting tight. You, you know, you have the tools and you know what you need to do of just like reassess your nutrients, your nutrient timing, the food that you're consuming and make a few adjustments. And it doesn't have to be long-term, but it's like, you do have to apply some effort in order to maintain your results. And so building those habits, um, you can always lean on those at different points in your life, but you don't have to be so hardcore all the time with everything. Now you, you are very physique based, but do you ever get anybody that comes to you for like performance goals? Cause a lot of what you do is very performance based as well. No, no? I don't. Yeah. No, like, uh, I don't know. Like when you say performance, like powerlifting type of stuff, or uh, it could be, the, or even like endurance athletes that want to do a, you know, 10 K or like a half marathon or a marathon or anything like that. Anything that's not necessarily a physique based goal, but they want their body to perform at a higher level. Cause like a lot of what you're saying is very synonymous with how you would train any type of athlete, not just a physique athlete. Yeah. I, I actually, I don't get very many people that do like I've had people who say like I'm training for a half marathon or a 5k or they'll just randomly do it mm. <laughs> and but I'm not helping them in their preparation for it I did the the closest I got was a client that was prepping for a 10k and mm. so I was just making sure because she was doing so much she was doing um, like hot yoga and training five days a week and doing a fitness class and doing this 10k and she wanted to be in fat loss so she was doing so much. Right. So I was able to like readjust things and said, Hey, like you want to do a fitness class. You can do it on the same day as you train. And then we're going to bring up your food because you're doing all these things. And so it, it, I was able to like pick here and there how to do stuff. But as far as like the running goals and how many miles she had to run and stuff that was on her, she just told me. And then I just made sure she was eating enough right. type right. of thing. So yeah. that's, that's as close as I've got to something like that. Do you work with a lot of physique competitors too, or is it still just mostly the general population people with physique goals? Yeah, just mostly general pop. I've got about five contest prep clients who want, want to compete. How fun is that? It's fun. Is it? I feel like I, it's fun up until the day of, and then it's got to be just, oh man, that's <laughs> a lot to deal with. Well, it's really, I mean, it's really hard to prep because you've got, you've got to like suffer. Yeah. That's what I mean. Those people have got to be a lot like just dealing with people on a regular basis is tough for me. I could not imagine somebody who's depleted of carbohydrates and is just basically knocking on death's door almost. <laughs> yeah. It, and it's hard. And and so there, it, you know, contest prep, there's a lot of people that do it. And with social media, I feel like it's picked up a lot more. You know, you see a lot of people competing in, in the sport and it's, uh, uh, I feel like I, I'm not a good example of this because I did it on a whim. I was a person that was like, Oh, whatever, what the heck? Like I had no idea about it back in 2016, but now people seeing what it's about because so many people talk about it on Instagram and see these fitness accounts and stuff. Uh, a lot of people do do it on a whim and they uh, don't realize what's required and how much effort it takes. 
Right. And a lot of them come to this thinking, well, this is going to be the way that I'm going to get the body of my dreams. I'm going to do this like really extreme diet. And then I'm going to be able to look like that forever. You know, like there's this notion that they'll be able to change things, but you, you don't go into a contest prep to look like the ending result. You do a contest prep for whatever other reasons, like you have to find some, something else, you know, right. um, it's not going to help you overcome eating disorders or body dysmorphia. It will make everything worse. Right. Everything. <laughs> like, and so you have to come in with a really good mindset. So that's, you know, like the way that I approach things with my clients is we have to build those habits. Like you have to be good with who you are and who you are like right now, because you're going to get leaner and you're not, you're still like, you're not going to be happy with what you look like. You're going to wish it was leaner. It's just this interesting thing that happens to people unless you can learn to appreciate yourself in the moment. Um, and it's a hard, like you can't really teach that, you know, you keep trying to reiterate that, but <laughs> That's why I, I think that I have like the longevity in the sport of like, I appreciate the leanness and I really do. Like when I'm there, I'm like, I take lots of pictures. I do, I do videos and I'm like, Oh, look at the pump I got today. But I realize like, that's not a place where I can live and maintain. It's super unhealthy. So never look as good as you do with a pump, right? Like it's always chasing the pump forever it, chasing. the. Pump. It's so fun. That's why you always take a picture after you work out. There you go. What would you say would be like a realistic timeline for somebody who decided that they wanted to do a competition? And let's just say, because bikini is the least muscular, right? Out of the classes, they're the ones that have the least amount of mass. What would be like a realistic timeline for somebody who's never done that to be like, okay, I want to do this and do semi decently. It would depend on the body fat that they have to start with. Um, let's say they're just an average, like say, 20% for a female or 25% something like that. Well, the other things too would be like, do they have good habits with nutrition? How often are they training? No, no, no. This is literally somebody who just thinks they can go do it. Like, you know, those disrespectful people that are like, oh yeah, I could do that. And you're like, no, you can't. Like, that's what, that's what kind of what I'm getting at is like, because you know, there's people that are probably going to listen to this at some point. They're like, I could do that. And it's like, no, I, I don't think you can. Because I don't think you know how hard people work at this. That's what, so yeah, we're, I think we're on the same page. Cause that's why I'm asking you all these questions. I'm like, well, well, do they have this set in place and nope. do they have this nope. set? Okay. So that's the thing is like, I don't, I don't feel like you could just be like, okay, I'm going to hire this coach and, and people do it. There's going to be coaches that will take your money and absolutely do it and put you into a prep and you might be successful and you might win, but did you learn anything? Did you have any habits established? Are you now messed up and feeling like you have, you want to look like this for the rest of your life. When deep down, you know, when you started, like this isn't something you can maintain. Uh, there's just like all these different, you know, things that come into it. And so the whole bucket list thing, I, I, I'm not here to tell people what they can and can't do, but you, I don't think that like, it's a good, a good idea. Um, right. Even with bikini being the least muscular, you're still, getting to really lean levels of body fat and um it's still hard and right. you know so it it it's it's hard and lots of bikini competitors it while you're not getting as lean as the the bodybuilding guys or like even the women's figure right. you know competitors you still get lean enough where you lose your period. So you get to unhealthy levels, like a lot of people, right. not everybody, but it happens to a lot of people. They get, um, all these health issues that can come as a result of it. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of things to consider and a lot of, um, yeah, educate yourself on stuff. Right. Before you do things, right. Now, yeah. when I worked at the gold's gym, cause obviously bodybuilding was the thing there. Um, it was a thing where these girls would hire these coaches and these coaches would put them on these absurd diets and then feed them drugs. And then that was like their 12 week prep to win a show. Is that still a thing in bodybuilding? Is that how people still like to do business in some places? Cause like that is what I think people need to be most weary of is like, people will not know you. They will give you a 12 week program and they'll be like, yeah, take these chemicals and just eat nothing. And yeah, you'll be fine. Yes. That's that still happens. 
Oh, Ed- just educate yourself. Just <clears throat> educate yourself is what I, I what I will say. Don't just do something because someone told you to. It, it doesn't matter that they're your coach and you hired them. You are literally paying them. They're providing a service to you. And even like with me being a coach for my clients, like they're, you know, they are lifestyle general population clients. I still want them to be educated. I don't want them to blindly follow what I, what I say. So if I suggest, Hey, like, I want you to, to take um, four days off of training this week. And like, they can ask me why I'm going to explain why, but um, I don't want them to just be like, okay, well, I trust you. And I'm like, well, that's not a good reason. You know, like even with you go to the doctor and the, and the doctor tells you, he wants to give you some prescription for some ailment you have double check, like just always educate yourself on, you know, get a second opinion. Like if you're worried about something or if it doesn't make sense, or if it's something you've never heard of before you consume, even like a prescription medication from a doctor, like maybe it might be good to figure out what it is. So let alone like something that a coach is telling you to take so you can be on a stage in, in less than four months, you know, right? like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've had those clients that have dealt with those coaches, right? And then you have to rebuild their hormones and their thyroids and all this stuff because they didn't know how to reverse diet or even know how to cut in the first place. And like, there's serious consequences to not cutting properly, right? Yeah, there really is. You want to set yourself up for a a, a prep that could be successful. And that, that goes even for gen pop clients too. You want to set them up for a good fat loss phase where they can go in and make the most of it. And so that is like building, building those habits, um, focusing on the big rocks of those just like n- nutrients, like making sure, like, are you eating enough protein? Are you, are you getting a couple of servings of green vegetables a day? Are you drinking enough water? Are you walking are you moving? Like, you know, just these like little basic things before you go into those tiny nuanced, um, type of situations. Like you just focus on the big things. And then once, once you've got that, then, you know, then consider the other stuff. So I will never take a client right into, um, a fat loss phase, let alone a contest prep. Like I want to make sure that they're in a good spot. Cause I have, you know, number one rule is as any coach should follow is to do no harm. I, you know, you hear that time, time and again, um, time and time again. And, and so if you just throw somebody into something where you don't really know their past or if they can even handle it, you might be putting them in a situation prone for harm. Um, If you are a contest prep um, coach, then you, they, the client needs to realize that what they're doing is not healthy. (laughs) So there is that, like you go into it being like, this is a situation where you could lose your period where things, you know, could happen. Um, you know, your liver could get upset for a little bit because you've been on low carbs and low fat and doing more, more cardio and like things like that. Like it's not healthy, nothing about doing a contest prep is healthy. So you have to be aware of the consequences and be, um, adult enough to make these decisions and be like, okay, I'm going to do this knowing full, you know, I'm being fully aware of the fact that there could be consequences that I have to pay for on the other side, you know, but doing it the best that you possibly can. And you can, like, it's still not healthy. Anytime I prep, it's not a healthy thing, but you, you can set yourself up for a, a good, you know, return to normal life. Type of you thing. can minimize the damage you're doing to yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you mentioned protein. What is, what is like your minimum or what is it you look for as far as like an adequate amount of protein for somebody? Do you base it off of their body weight, what they want to weigh, how much lean tissue they want to have? Cause this seems to be like a highly debated topic. And I've just gotten to the point where I go, I don't think you can eat too much. So eat as much as you want. And it's gotta be at least this much. Yeah. Well, we know what the research says, right? Um, And so I usually just aim for as long as a person is in a healthy body fat level, they're not an an obese individual to begin with, then I aim for about just one gram per pound of their body weight. I don't even go off like an estimated lean, lean tissue, and especially for body composition clients. Um, But, you know, if they're looking, because it's better to eat a little bit more protein, it's, it's uh, keeps you fuller, longer. And there's no negative consequences 
you know, research has shown time. Again. What do you mean? It's not going to hurt my kidneys. Your kidneys are going to be okay. And if your doctor tells you that your kidneys are going to be having problems due to eating a little bit more protein, get a second opinion. Just mm. uh, educate yourself. Mm. Any ladies listening to this, you should be eating at least 120 grams of protein <laughs> per day, probably, unless you're five feet tall and only 100 pounds. Yeah. And so you're looking at size too. And is, this comes into calorie intake because you hear people say too, like, you know, for women, especially like nobody should eating, be eating less than 1500 calories. But if I have a client that's 411, like possible, um, that might, that might be, that might be okay. Like, and it's not going to be a bad thing. Like you're looking at their size and their, and their height and their weight and their energy output. Like there's so many variables that come into how much food they're eating. So you're not just always trying to get all women to eat 2000 calories. Like I'm not going to shove, shove 2000 calories down this teeny little hundred pound person's throat. If that's not like, it just doesn't make sense. So those, you know, there's those type of, um, things that get thrown around of like, if you're not eating 2000 calories a day, then your coach isn't doing the best for you. And it's like, well, uh, yeah. yeah but on top of that, you also have very high knowledge on how to make your nutrition guidelines match the training that they're doing in the gym. Right. So like you would get a even better synergistic effect for your body transformations for people than say just a person who's basing it off of like their BMI, right. Or their B their basal metabolic rate. Yes. Yeah. It makes it, it's very, it's been very fun as I've gotten better at doing that too. It's really fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it, the nutrition really like when people, especially with like body composition goals, whether it's building more mass or even getting leaner, when you nail the nutrition part of it, it's amazing how much that like ex exponentially helps what you're doing in the gym. Mm -hmm. it, it makes a huge difference. And um, just real quick, I want to go back to the protein. Yep. Sometimes people want to just base it off of like your lean mass. That's fine. I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can do it, but you want to make sure you're eating a sufficient amount of protein. The other thing is, is if you're, if you get a client that's coming to you and they're only eating like, you know, 60, 60 grams of protein a day or something, you don't just want to double up to 120 overnight. <laughs> right. So it's like, you slowly like titrate that up because that's going to be, um, it's going to be a, a little bit problematic for their digestive system at first, getting used to a, a, that significant amount of an increase in protein. And so I usually tell people when I give them macros, I go, these are your goals. Like, we're probably not going to hit these for a while, but like, this is what we would want to be at eventually. So you can be at a nice lean body weight at this weight. They're like, oh my God, how am I going to eat all that? I'm like, well, you're not going to. First of all, you're going to try and we're going to see how close you get. And then we're going to keep doing that over time and keep adding to it. It's like, like they always see it and they're like, oh, how can I do that? And I, I did the same thing, but I was lucky. Like I did this when I was 20. And when the guy told me, I'm like, how in the hell do you expect me to eat all of this? He's like, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. And now 10 years later, I eat way more than he ever told me. And I weigh what I want to weigh, but you know, it's just a slow, steady process. Kind of like the gym. Who would have thought? Yeah, exactly. You just start where you're at and don't expect to be where you want to be right away. Like you just yeah. slowly chip away. I love it. It's so true. Yeah. Right. yeah. Anything else, Nathan? I don't think I have any more questions. I don't think so. She answered every, everything I was looking for. You guys asked so many good questions and I talked a lot. So I hope you don't mind. This was <laughs> no, that's, this that's, great. that's, we do that on purpose. Yes. We did one yesterday where it's just us bullshitting. So this was all for you because I knew you had a bunch of good stuff to say. So, <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Guys. Well, thank you. Appreciate you coming on. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys don't already follow Val, you need to follow her on Instagram. Do you have any other social medias or anything else, Val? Just Instagram, Valerie Lasfardi, and then my website. You can nice. check out my website for stuff. So, yeah, if, if any chicks actually listen to this podcast, go hire Val because she's awesome. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I'm laughing. <laughs> You're good. We, we don't know either. <laughs> we don't We're know. all We're, in this together. It's, it's all, all irrelevant. All of us flying into the abyss. Thanks. That's right. Yeah. But All right. Well, thank you very much, Val. I hope you have a great day. You too. Thanks, guys. Thank yep. you. Have a good one.